He'd been planning for it all spring and summer, his baby, what all of his offensives had been leading up to. But this week, Ludendorff cancels his plans. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week saw the beginning of the Second Battle of the Marne, but the German advance was stalled by the French defense in depth system, and the Allied counterattack, spearheaded by Americans and Senegalese and using some 500 tanks, smashed through the German lines at the end of the week. A German attack on the British in Palestine failed, the Army of Islam is stalled by dysentery in the Caucasus, and the former Russian Tsar Nicholas and his family were executed in Ekaterinburg. Here's what followed. The salient on the Western Front that the German advance in late May and early June had created was no longer really holdable by the middle of the week. On the 21st, the Germans abandoned Chateau Thierry. On the 22nd, they were pushed back nearly 10 kilometers, and again on the 23rd, as British tanks advanced up at the Somme. Still, the action by the Marne was mainly a French battle, and French General Philippe Piton had followed up last week's counterattacks with new attacks on the 20th, in the south and east sides of the salient. David Stevenson points out that he committed 50 reserve divisions to this, leaving exactly zero fresh reserves left. But after the 20th, the Allied advance couldn't help but slow down since one, they were beyond their artillery's range, and two, the wooded countryside they had to cover was dotted with German machine gun nests. Three, they no longer had the element of surprise, and four, a lot of their tanks were out of action. In Martin Gilbert, I read something German Chancellor Georg von Hettling wrote about the first few days of the battle. The Germans were still expecting to receive peace proposals within two months, with Paris at their mercy. That was on the 15th. On the 18th, even the most optimistic among us knew that all was lost. The history of the world was played out in three days. Having said that, when Hertling asked German Quartermaster General Erich Ludendorff if the German army could ever take the offensive again, Ludendorff said, Five times thus far during the war I had to withdraw my troops and was still able at the end to beat the enemy. Why shouldn't I succeed a sixth time? But let's look at the new situation after the attacks and counterattacks of last week. In mid-March, when the German offensives were just about to begin. They had 300,000 more troops on the Western Front than the Allies did. But between then and now, a million German soldiers had been killed, wounded, or captured. And a lot of these were the stormtroops who were not easily replaced. The French and the British had also lost a million men together. And though the French would have problems replacing theirs, the Americans were now pouring in at like 250,000 per month. And now they were fighting too. So by this time, it was the Allies that had a few hundred thousand more troops there than the Germans, and that gap was widening every day. This week, on the 24th, Allied leaders Ferdinand Foch, Sir Douglas Haig, Pitan, and John Pershing met and agreed that they would soon launch a series of coordinated offensives. Haig's guys would attack eastward from Amiens, Pitan's north from the River Marne, and Pershing's south of Verdun. All of the main objectives were railway lines. On the 25th, the Germans made another desperate attempt to surround Rem. This was a complete failure since the German armies just didn't have the bite anymore, though their retreat was an orderly one, even with Allied counterattacks. Remember our episodes from September and October 1914? Doesn't it sound like that all over again? The Germans reach the Marne, the Germans cross the Marne, they cannot maintain the pressure and get pushed back, and then they regroup along the Ain. Thing is, the German army now faced a stronger enemy, and a lot more of them, and we've talked to the point of boredom about the German lack of resources or replacement troops. It was a grim situation. But everything wasn't exactly rosy for the Allies. G.J. Meyer points out in A World Undone that the end of the German threat to Paris meant the end of any chance for the Clemenceau government to fall, which meant the end of any chance for a French government that would seek peace instead of prolonging the war for who knew how long. The French now had combat units that were entirely made up of men over 40. The British were drafting men of 50 into their army. And look at the map. Germany not only had basically all of Eastern Europe, they had more of the Western Front than they had just a few months ago. But Germany had fresh problems. On the 20th, 
the Flanders Offensive that Quartermaster General Erich Ludendorff had been waiting to launch all summer, Operation Hagen, hit some hitches. That day, German command received recommendations to postpone it for a few days in light of the ongoing German failures in France. Now, the Battle of Soissons, the Allied counterattack that began at the end of last week, ended after just four days, but it had cost the Germans 168,000 casualties to just over 100,000 for the Allies. German general and strategic planner Fritz von Losberg recommended now executing Hagen with whatever was available, but as a limited tactical attack and not a big operational one. He also recommended that after that, putting the whole front on the defensive with lines further back behind areas that could be flooded. Ludendorff, though, could not bring himself to give up all the ground gained over the spring and go back into an attritional war of defense. Still, after the next couple of days, forced by circumstances in France, Hagen was called off indefinitely. The Great Flanders Offensive that was supposed to be the point of everything the Germans had done was overdue and unlikely to ever take place. Ludendorff himself was in obvious torment. To all the weight of his military problems was added the fear of what would happen when the German public, still assured daily that his armies were victorious in the field, awoke to the magnitude of his failure. So in a general view, all of that force, all of that fighting, all that the Germans had done in even getting to the Marne was for nothing. But you know who'd done a whole lot more traveling? The Czechoslovak Legion. On the 24th, the Legionnaires reached the Volga River and now held a nearly 5,000 kilometer line from the Volga to the Pacific. The next day, they reached Ekaterinburg, where the Tsar and his family were recently murdered. At the end of the week, in the north, French troops added their numbers to the British at Murmansk. So if you look at the big picture, including the Germans holding the formerly Russian shores of the Black Sea, the Bolsheviks were now struggling to hold power in just the center. And here are a couple of notes to end the week. On the 22nd, Ernst Seidler von Feuchtenegg resigns as Austrian minister president, succeeded by Dr. Maximilian Husarek von Heinlein. On the 25th, British aircraft dropped 300 tons of bombs behind the German lines near Amiens. But the following day, the top scoring British flying ace of the war with 72 kills, though only 61 officially, Edward McManick met his fate. He shot down his 73rd plane, but after that disregarded his own rule and flew low over the wreckage and into a storm of German small arms fire. As he and his New Zealander wingman flew away, the wingman saw a blue flame spout from Manick's engine cowling. Then the left wing of Manick's plane broke off and he plunged to his death. Interestingly enough, it was really unlikely that Manick should have ever been in the skies in the first place. When the war broke out, he had been in Turkey laying telephone cables, and being British, he was imprisoned. After a failed escape attempt, he was put in solitary and then contracted dysentery. The American consulate got his release, but when he tried to enlist back in Britain, he was at first classified as unfit for military duty. It would not be until late 1916 that he qualified as a pilot. And the week comes to an end, with the Allies still gaining ground in the West and making plans for new offensives, even as the Germans are forced to cancel theirs and the Bolsheviks, who are not even fighting this war, find themselves surrounded by its participants. It's been exactly four months since Operation Michael began the German spring offensives and the Germans have lost a million men. And the Allies have lost a million men. Two million men in four months one third of one year. And you think that cannot be sustainable. I mean, how, how long can that go on? And then you realize that next week it'll be four years it's been going on. And that's just par for the course. And there's still no end in sight. If you want to learn more about the German spring offensives of 1918 and how it all started, you can click right here for our weekly episode about that. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Patrick McColgan. Please support us on Patreon if you want better and more maps and animations and things like that for this fantastic show. And do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.